You're listening to Conferences on Light Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 17, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, contact dermatitis in adult and pediatric populations. Our presenter is Dr. Sharon Jacob. She's a professor and chief of the dermatology section at the University of California, Riverside and Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California. What I'm talking, I'm a dermatologist, um, so I'm not an allergist. Um, I had allergy training um, in medical school, and also uh, I took electives in residency because I found it extremely interesting. So that's um, that's my uh, experience in terms of my background. Um, what I'm talking today is uh, contact dermatitis in both adult and pediatric populations. And I wanted to make sure you guys had the chance because in the past, I think that I tried to do too many slides and I didn't have enough time for um, more of an interactive. So I want to make sure that we have that time built in today. Let's see. It's not uh, going forward. Let me try this way. There we go. So um, what I wanted to make sure we touch base on today is um, the uh, brief introduction to urticarial, irritant, and allergic dermatitis, and the differences in those in terms of mechanisms. Um, uh, talk about some cases of allergic contact dermatitis, and uh, as time permits, talk about some of the more common um allergens, which would be your metals, fragrances, uh, rubber chemicals, preservatives, and then hopefully have uh, uh, inbuilt in uh, question and answer time as we go. So almost any substance has the potential to produce an adverse effect in the skin. And the risks of developing these adverse effects depend on a multitude of factors, but very importantly is the condition of the exposed skin. I always think of the skin as a brick and mortar model, where the bricks are the cells and the mortar is the protective lipids that is uh, intercalating between the bricks. Now, if your if your mortar is damaged, like in atopic dermatitis, where you don't make enough ceramides one and three, your bricks will be at a higher risk of interacting with each other. Uh, the cytokines they're putting out um, are are stimulating each other. They they're, they're going to rub against each other basically, and they're going to be irritated and inflamed. Also, the concentration of the agent you're putting on the skin. Uh, very, very dilute bleach versus very, very strong bleach will have a different effect. And then, of course, the duration of contact. When we think about contact urticaria or hives, it is probably the, one of the least common um, of the contact derm group. Um, we've also got protein contact, which is also uncommon, but it's going to represent less than half a percent of the whole group. Um, like allergic contact dermatitis, it requires a prior exposure and the um, event will demonstrate your hive, wheel, and flare type reaction. This is IgE mediated and this is um, dependent and inter, um, uh, it, it is affected by antihistamines. So if you are doing one of the, the one of the um, things I, um, failures in the system I see is that people, uh, keep people on their antihistamines when they're testing for contact or to carry it. Now, you, you wouldn't do that. You would definitely stop them for this test. If you were to use a commercially available uh, patch test to test for contact urticaria, you need to make sure you're doing an early read. I read those tests at 30 minutes and one hour. Um, I also put the test back on the patient in the place that it was and also do a late read. But I have uh, patients that are referred in for uh, contact urticaria. They've had a patch test and I asked them, when did they read the patch test? And they said, oh, seven days. And I said, but when did they first read it? And I've had people say seven days. I've left my patches on for seven days. Well, we don't do that. We, we take them off even in a delayed test at 48 hours. But it's very, very important to know the time periods to read these tests. With irritant contact dermatitis, that is not something that we use the uh, 
patch test to evaluate for now the allergy patch test this accounts for the largest amount the largest percent of people who have contact dermatitis so you're looking at about 80 percent of the group anybody can get this anybody at all it results from the physical exposure of an injured substance to the surface of the skin so if we put bleach on everybody that we're testing at different concentrations there is a concentration at which every person's skin will respond depending on the integrity of that brick and mortar model so this is a non-immunologic event it is a direct epidermal keratinocyte damage and the release of inflammatory cytokines uh, the degree of irritation again is dependent on the concentration of the agent and the integrity of the skin an example would be irritant hand dermatitis from frequent frequent hand washing with harsh soaps however if you are in a topic dermatitis patient with low uh, ceramides one and three you have less mortar in your brick and mortar model you are going to have a higher uh, uh, risk of an irritant hand dermatitis at a with a less harsh soap so there's the harshness of the soap again is a factor of um, the alkalinity the acidity usually it's an alkaline if it's a soap and the integrity of the skin so here's a patient with irritant contact dermatitis. Um, it has a propensity for exposed areas of, um, of the hands, the face, eyes. Again, it can happen to anyone and it does not require prior sensitization. This is often a boards type question because again, it's an integrity issue. It's a relation of the skin tolerance to the chemical strength of the agent applied. So irritant contact can occur in um, many different situations. We do see it in diaper dermatitis at the very young and also in the aged population. Uh, urine and uh, fecal enzymes can be uh, uh, break down the skin so they can be a cause of irritant uh, dermatitis in that area. Oftentimes there is sparing of the folds because that was protected when that urine um, got in contact with the skin. This is an example of a hand dermatitis. Um, it's very, very subtle. You see um, an ashy look to the skin, uh, a little bit gray. Um, you see uh, dry, a dry appearing and uh, a, a, the, the um, semblance of a uh, rough, roughened texture. On the right, we see a patient who has um, sprayed a deodorant. Here we see the exact distribution of where the spray was. So with irritant contact dermatitis, it's going to affect exactly where the agent was applied. Whereas with allergic, you can start to see extension beyond the application area. This is an irritant dermatitis. Um, this is one of the... Um, uh, from the internet. This is a, uh, a henna tattoo uh, where a patient has had a reaction to one of the additives in the henna tattoo. But what's important here is that this reaction has occurred in less than 24 hours. So an irritant dermatitis is most often going to occur in less than 48 hours, whereas an allergic dermatitis is going to most often occur over 48 hours. These are examples of irritant dermatitis. On the right, we see a child with lip licking behavior. Um, I actually had uh, one of the kids' parents at school this week asked, um, can we do anything about this? And I looked and their kid had the perfect ring where their tongue reached. And I had that um, patient uh, or the parent start applying zinc oxide um, three times a day to the child and also applying it prior to teeth cleaning. Um, the, the key is barrier protection and cognitive intervention. So, you know, changing the behavior, which is very difficult, whereas the, but the children generally don't like the taste or the texture of the zinc. So that also is a, is a deterrent. Um, you can use a, uh, like a steroid topical uh, hydrocortisone in this case, but you, you want to remember that it will help with the inflammation slightly, but it will damage the repair of the barrier so it is a double-edged sword so I oftentimes try to avoid steroids in irritant dermatitis 
On the left is something we see commonly in the cosmetic industry. Low-grade irritants will be added to cosmetics to reduce the fine lines and wrinkles um, on, of appearance on the skin. So you, the, the industry will try to uh, create a gentle swelling so as to smooth the skin. So this is a, limp, a lip plumping lipstick that has been used and often they have derivatives of um, uh, capsaicin or, or a pepper a agent or um, a quote natural ingredient that causes uh, mild swelling. So this is a Pump Up Your Lip uh, Volume City Lips. Um, again, this one um, contained a cinnamon, ginger, and a menthol. Uh, the cross reactor for these uh, would be for allergic would be your balsam of Peru agents, um, uh, which is a tree sap from El Salvador. Um, and also these at uh, concentrations on thin barriers can also be irritants. So here's uh, just a comparative of a, an allergic dermatitis on the left and an irritant dermatitis on the right. On the left, we see the dependency of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the deodorant, the antiperspirant, that with the arm down, the sweat will make the concentration of that agent um, be in the dependent area, and that's what we see here. Uh, the vault is spared due to a dilutional effect. Um, and versus, um, and, and then once you get more and more allergen into the skin on the left, you will get the inflammatory response to that. So some key clinical features of irritant versus allergic. On the left, we see irritant. Again, it's usually within 48 hours. Um, it's typically a most often limit, the dermatitis is limited to the area of exposure and frequently it's diminished by 96 hours. So this means if you, um, you should start to see healing of the skin, you should start to see um, uh, the skin repair, um, self repair occurring and you should see the decrescendo of the reaction. Um, it may look like repetitive hand washing or one of the um, uh, uh, clinical scenarios I just presented. Allergic, on the other hand, is delayed. It usually occurs after 48 hours and can take five, six days, sometimes two weeks to respond. It may occur in the area of the exposure, but it oftentimes will expand beyond, and it can last for many, many days and sometimes weeks because the patient doesn't realize that they are continuing to be exposed to that agent and are repeatedly re-stimulating. This could look like poison ivy reaction or it could look like um, uh, hand dermatitis. It could just, it could look like atopic dermatitis in limited areas. So allergic dermatitis is going to account for about 20% of your contact derm group. Again, this is a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction or a type 4. Uh, this patient that we're showing here is allergic to concrete. They're allergic to the chromium in the concrete. Chromium can also be an irritant. Um, it allergic contact dermatitis requires prior sensitization, prior exposure, and can be subacute, acute, or chronic. So in the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, this is a T-cell mediated event. It consists of three phases, sensitization, the challenge, which is the re-exposure to the agent, and the resolution phase. This is from the New England Journal. It's actually a, um, uh, an older slide, but I really like this slide. So you see the antigen is getting into the skin. We have longer Hans or dendritic cells in the skin that capture that antigen and take it back through the afferent lymphatic system into the lymph node where they present the allergen to the naive T cell. The na naive T cell then becomes a CLA positive T cell and goes back through the afferent, um, uh, lymph uh, sorry, back into the efferent lymphatic system where it will get into the um, lymphatics and get transpedese into the skin where it will activate and cause a cytokine release. Um, and this is very important because this is how the skin becomes aware of the allergen itself. 
So the sensitization phase can take 7 to 21 days. Um, the antigen penetrates the epidermis and is covalently bonded to keratinocytes. Again, we have recognition by a dendritic cell and, and presentation to a naive T cell. The memory stage is when the antigen is presented to the naive T cell and T cell expansion occurs. Th1 clones occur both in the lymphatic system of which, well, in the lymph node, but also in the skin. The skin I always talk about as being equivalent to a giant lymph node and taking on some of those functions. In the recall event or the challenge phase, which takes approximately 48 to 96 hours, there is re-recognition of the antigen. There's recruitment of memory T cells, the secretion of cytokines, IL-2 and interferon gamma. And clinically normal skin, interestingly, will 21 days after patch testing will still show an increased uh, expression of CCL27, which is a marker, and an increased number of CCR10 and CD4 positive T cells. So there is memory occurring in the skin itself. In, in the challenge um, phase, you get this inflammation occurring. You'll get vasodilation, endothelial cell activation, mediator release, and a self-perpetuating cycle of leukocyte recruitment to the sites of antigen expression. This is extremely important because you can have recall response. So um, if you have, I had a patient who in Miami who came in for hand dermatitis and they had very, very significant hand dermatitis with blistering. We put the patches on, their hands um, blistered, and their eyelids became affected as well. And I said, you've had this before. And she said, I don't recall having an eyelid reaction. I said, is, is your mom still alive? And she said, yeah, she's in her 80s. I said, can we call her and ask her? And she said, sure. So in clinic, we call the mom and we say, hey, did uh, is there any memory or any recollection of her ever having, you know, really significant eyelid dermatitis? Oh, yeah, back in the seventh grade when she was dissecting that frog, she had to go to the emergency room. And the, then the, the patient remembered. And it turned out that the patient was allergic to formaldehyde. And when we put the formaldehyde on the patient in the patch test, the, the site of the formaldehyde blistered, the hands blistered, and she had a recall response to the eyelids that had remained unaffected for, for about 45 years. So the skin can remember for years and years. It's like an elephant. So um, ectopic dermatitis, um, on the other hand, is that um, it as opposed to a recall response, is when there's a um, dermatitis at a site of prior exposure when the allergen has often been transferred. So we will see this, um, we can see this, uh, an example of baboon syndrome where a patient has eaten, who's allergic to poison ivy, has eaten raw cashews and the oils in the cashews are cross-relate cross and then you'll get the uh, flare reaction on the uh, outside, on the, on the out, coming out of the allergen. We also see uh, ectopic dermatitis, um, we, we think about it with nail polish, where patients are painting their nails, and then they, they um, will rub their eyes, and they will uh, transfer the allergen that way. So ectopic dermatitis. In the resolution phase of uh, delayed hyper delayed type hypersensitivity, you'll see macrophages removing the allergens, you'll see loss of allergen or antigen stimulation, and that results in resolution. And thus, this is why avoidance is the mainstay of therapy, because as long as you stay away from the allergen, you're not going to have a recall response and you're not going to be reacting. There are situations where the body cannot remove the allergen, such as tattoo pigment, and you will get chronic stimulation and you will get a granuloma as, of, as is shown here. So remember the red pigment is going to be um, either cinnabar or a mercurial and the green and the blue is going to be cobalt and chromium. The black is carbon, white is uh, uh, zinc or titanium. We often see um, brown being added to uh, tattoos, which is iron. Uh, here's one of mine that has a granuloma, and they, they actually um, were positive to mercurials 
um, when I when I tested them. This is a foreign body gran a foreign body or a my this is a, a mycobacterial um, granuloma. This is after cosmetic tattooing, so it's really important to look at the um, potentially do a biopsy on these patients and, and not just say, oh, that's um, that's the mercurial here. That that's not a problem. Uh, that's just a mercurial because we do see um, patients who do get uh, atypical by mycobacteria. Um, being injected and they do need to be treated for infection. So approach to the patient, the history of exposures is going to be critical, but sometimes because of the delay in the reaction after exposure, patients won't know that the historical event is related. Uh, location of the reaction, I think, is the the, the glass ball. It, once um, you start to get your mind into this Sherlockian uh, discovery, um, a Sherlock Holmes discovery type of, of, of processing, you can start to look for geographic clues. And this can help guide the selection of which allergens to place. So here's an example. This one's from the literature of a patient who's allergic to dyes. Um, Oftentimes, if they're allergic to the nickel on the back of a watch, they'll have just a circle on the other side of the hand, so you, uh, arm. So you want to look at what kind of reaction the patient is having and where it is occurring. Um, this um, is extending beyond this bandwidth. If I had a I had a, a, a group, I used to um, be a volunteer with the. Uh, Red Cross, and I would uh, for about five years, and I uh, worked at the Navy uh, hospital in Balboa as a as a Red Cross volunteer, and I would see patients coming in off the ships who had been experiencing contact dermatitis, and I would do consults for them, and there was this uh, a new group who were going through training, and. Two of them had been hospitalized for this blistering and swelling of their feet and they couldn't walk, but the entire troop had been affected with itchy, uh, itchy feet. And I had been brought in on the case and it sure enough was very interesting. Not, uh, not every single one in the troop had been affected, but the ones that were affected, the clue was none of them had washed their socks prior to wearing the socks. And the socks had, had been sprayed with an agent to stop uh, fungus growing. So the concentration of that agent uh, obviously was higher in the unwashed socks and certain people had a higher, um, a decreased integrity of their skin barrier due to sweating or atopic dermatitis and they had, in, they had um, ab absorbed more of that chemical. Um, but what was interesting is there was a sharp demarcation of line for where the socks were. That was the clue. So in this case, if this was a reaction an irritant, you would expect a much thinner band. You wouldn't expect it to be expanding beyond the area. So this is a clue that this is probably allergic. So again, um, location is going to be the most uh, a, a key factor, one of the most important parts. So here we see this uh, contact dermatitis to um, uh, toilet seats. We see it both from um, an irritant uh, perspective and an allergic perspective. Um, on the allergic side, uh, we've seen it in the literature and I've had one case um, of somebody allergic to the rosin in the wood uh, toilet seat and we always recommend a plastic uh, toilet seat in those cases or a cover, a cotton cover or some um, fabric. The, the issue with the irritant dermatitis is that if somebody sits on the toilet soon after it has been uh, treated, cleaned, um, they could potentially get a reaction to that. However, we have seen people who are allergic to uh, fragrances in the cleaning agents, but the reaction was more smoldering, um, more long-term, and uh, less of an acute event. So being aware that you can have both allergic and irritant dermatitis to uh, toilet seats and toilet seat cleaners. This is a patient who was allergic to Brazilian holly. This is one of my cases that I got called to the ER in when I was a resident. 
And this is a patient who's been running through the bushes in uh, Miami. Brazilian holly is related to poison ivy, um, and they had uh, a reaction to the uh, urochiol uh, that they um, had been exposed to when they were running through the bushes uh, wearing a sleeveless shirt playing tag. This is a patient who has this perioral dermatitis. Um, they, um, they have a specific sparing that is noted here. So we know that this is most likely not irritant dermatitis to the um, lip licking or saliva. Um, the, the distribution is, is suggestive of an allergic dermatitis. Uh, it turned out he was allergic to vanilla, um, and one of my nurses had given him a lollipop in clinic, um, and I uh, took a look at it, and unfortunately, she gave him the vanilla one. Um, I remember saying, oh, no, he can't have that in front of him. This is in the early days, and he started crying, and it, it was very traumatic for him um, that he had an association with um, something he really, really loved. But it's really, really important to be aware of um, the flavorant and fragrance agents that we are being exposed to on a regular basis because they can be a, uh, a very uh, significant source of allergic dermatitis. So I just want to touch base on the commercially available test. This is a 36 allergen pre-made uh, antigens. It came out in 81, uh, had an update in 96, and launched again with the third panel um, uh, in, the, in the 2004, I believe. Um, uh, this is a mild reaction here to a Mercapto mix, which shows a, a indurated square with these uh, micropapules forming in it. It's got erythema. It's starting to uh, misshape from the square. So this is a, 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 a two plus reaction because you do have those uh, papules within it and it is indurated. But you can also make up your own panels. This is um, us uh, in the early days. Uh, now we get the panels that already have the Ed fixed uh, uh, filter paper, so we don't have to uh, stick those in. Uh, early on, we were we'd had issues where sometimes these fell out before the liquids um, were placed in. So we either uh, put Vaseline under these and stuck them in, or we uh, put the filter paper at the time of loading the liquid allergen. Uh, to keep the uh, uh, patch from rolling up, we use the forever dependable uh, cotton-tipped applicator. Uh, the, you can have an extensive tray. These are aluminum uh, chambers. Um, this is 139 allergens that we were putting on a patient. This was out of uh, 3,700 that we could have selected from. Uh, in Miami, I had about uh, probably six, 700 allergens at the time I left. Um, I left that clinic. Um, the uh, now I don't have nearly the um, the bandwidth uh, that I had there in terms of the number of allergens. Um, but I do a lot of uh, rote testing and uh, uh, substrate testing, so I will be testing the patients uh, uh, agents um, themselves. Uh, this is comprehensive patch testing. This is loading up an adult patient and uh, with the North American Contact Derm um, screen. This is in the early days. Now the American Contact Derm Society has a core panel that it routinely updates, um, looking at different geographic areas and different allergens based on their frequencies in uh, reporting. So approach to the patient with allergic dermatitis, um, you're, historically you want to be looking for um, exposures, uh, temporal relationships. Uh, physically, um, on, in terms of the physical limitations, if you've got a child, you'll have a small area that you will be able to patch test. So um, I generally uh, have a rough uh, cut off at about eight years of age for when I would uh, be putting on the, uh, the the level of an adult screens. Although some of my eight-year-olds have been almost the same size or bigger than some of my adult patients, but in terms of this small area, this can also be a factor when you have extensive dermatitis. 
So you're going to uh, select which allergens um, you're going to want to place. Uh, and again, the commercially available kit was designed for adults but can be used on children. I had done um, early on a, a review of the literature just to look at what allergens uh, were top uh, worldwide to try to figure out where should our starting point be in testing for children. And it turns out that relevant allergens um, in the pediatric population are equally relevant um, in adults. So these are some of the allergens that you would want to make sure you're testing for. Uh, Cocomedal purple betaine is not one that is on the um, commercially available kit. However, it is a very important allergen, especially in our atopic populations. I just want to take a moment and just see um, uh, does anybody have any questions at this point before we start getting into uh, just some more of the allergens? Does anybody have any questions about the differences in um, the types of contact dermatitis, um, when you would test for them, or, or any basic questions that they had? Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, yeah, you're, you're, you're coming through good. I'm, I'm monitoring the chat to see if anybody puts anything in there too. So um, I'll let you know if anything pops up. I don't know if I can see the chat. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on it. So if something pops up, I'll let you know. Okay, so um, if no questions, I'm just going to uh, start talking about some allergens and then um, uh, just go till we get cut up. <laughs> so um, nickel um, dermatitis uh, is a highly prevalent in, in both highly prevalent uh, problem in both adults and uh, children. This is a patient I had seen um, who came in with a hand dermatitis when I patch tested her. This recall response occurred. I asked her if she had any decorative jewelry that she wore at that level and she said no. Um, I noticed she was wearing a rear closing bra strap. I asked her about uh, front closing and it turned out she said that she had stopped wearing those because of reactions to them in the past. So again, this was a recall response occurring many years after um, she had thought, you know, she hadn't used those bras and had thought the skin had forgotten. Nickel is found in deposits with chromium and cobalt. Uh, it co-responds or co-reacts with cobalt um, oftentimes. This is a patient who is allergic to this uh, uh, belt buckle here, and it accounts for 15 to 25% of the allergic uh, dermatitis that we see nationwide. And oftentimes patients with nickel allergy don't make it to the dermatologist. They're seen by the primary care physician. Uh, the primary, for, uh, uh, primary care physician will notice the earlobe dermatitis and notice that it's associated with the, the piercing or the the nickel earrings or the uh, costume jewelry, and that patient will never make it to see us. One thing I would highly recommend um, is that if you are um, know of somebody who's going to get their ears pierced, I would recommend that they get the plastic posts um, that are available on the market so they are not exposing their open wound to a metal agent or um, even if it's uh, stainless steel or titanium or if it's gold, I would recommend that the plastic uh, earrings are worn until the healing phase has um, resolved. Again, this is the number one allergen. Uh, it can be um, in paper clips, it can be in needles, it can be gene snaps, orthodontic braces. Um, there is uh, literature that shows if you get your ears pierced, after you've had orthodontic braces, you're less likely to have a nickel allergy. So all my kids have um, got their braces at this point and uh, we're waiting for uh, those to come off before I would consider piercing. Um, but it turns out that it has something to do with the tolerance of being the oral exposure to the nickel preventing the, um, the allergic response um, with the epidermal exposure and sensitization or um, at a later date. 
food. So food is usually not the primary instigating event because, again, of tolerance. However, if you have a patient who is allergic to nickel and they have a, a widespread allergy, oftentimes nickel in, intake in the diet can uh, evoke or provoke the uh, extensive dermatitis to worsen. So I have patients who, the, um, I actually had a, a number of nickel allergic children that had come in um, with really severe um, flares of their of their dermatitis. Um, this was early in the after residency and I just started the clinic. And we were trying to figure out why we were getting the calls and why these patients were coming in. And it turned out that it was uh, temporarily related to Easter. <clears throat> and we, we wrote it up because um, when on uh, questioning and discussion, we learned that a lot of the children had snuck chocolate and had a not just a small amount of chocolate, but a binge of chocolate, and they had flared their dermatitis. So chocolate is... High, has a high amount of nickel, uh, so does uh, oatmeal, uh, legumes, um, <coughs> excuse me, hazelnuts, asparagus, uh, sunflower seeds, uh, soy. Um, this is all from the nickel being absorbed by the plant from the soil. <coughs> uh, chrome, another metal, um, can um, be a contact allergen that we often see in people who are allergic to leather goods and also in our construction workers who are exposed to concrete. Sorry, let me just grab my tea here. <coughs> so chromate exposure, we see it from cement <clears throat> and from leather tanners. So what they do with the leather, sorry, talking too much, what they do with the leather is that they um, take the hide and they um, process it by exposing it to the metal, which causes it to soften. So that's called tanning the leather. They will then add formaldehyde or another agent to the leather to um, fix the leather or harden the leather. So you can get patients who are allergic to leather who could be responding to either the tanning process of the metal exposure, the tanning component, or the processing component of the formaldehyde. So when we see these patients that are responding to the leather, it can be a leather recliner, it can be a leather steering wheel and hand dermatitis, it can be uh, leather seats in the car. We want to make sure they have a barrier and we are covering that. We see it to leather gloves and gardeners and again in cement. Uh, it's also in green textiles um, uh, like uh, felt. Um, there was a period of time um, where there was a number of reports of uh, of green felt and gambling tables. Um, green is oftentimes preferred because it tells people go. It tells people to keep gambling, whereas red, uh, even though it's luxurious and uh, a very um, sensual color, um, it can um, cause people to think stop. But oftentimes red will encourage people to want to engage. It's a very um, sensual color and it will uh, encourage people to engage in activities. Um, you'll often see uh, people choose red in feng shui for a dining room because of its effect on um, eating and, and dining. And it's, it's a very interesting how colors can affect us. But green in the felt can often be uh, associated with chromium. It's also a wood preservative. It's also in tattoos um, for the chromate. It's the green color. And it can also be in sutures such as chromic cat gut. Chromium containing foods, again, foods are often seen in the context of a widespread dermatitis, but would not be your primary um, focal point for address. So when you are worried about exposure, you wouldn't uh, leave the contact uh, with the agent with the skin in 
engagement and take away the food. You would first start with de, de, uh, disengaging the skin from contacting the agent. Um, so chromium-containing foods, brewer's yeast is by far the highest. Uh, black pepper, cloves, um, some processed meat, um, thyme, does ha- the, uh, the herb does have a lot of chromium in it. Cobalt, um, again, another metal. Um, we uh, we think of this uh, in terms of the vitamin B12. Uh, I have had patients who have um, uh, stimulated themselves with the vitamin. Again, uh, we would not take away the vitamin before taking away the topical contact with the agent. Cobalt has been associated with leather dermatitis um, in the recent literature. And cobalt blue um, glass, um, historically in the 20s, was a very, very popular um, uh, uh, product. Fragrances and flavorants. Um, the commercially available kit has a fragrance mix, which has uh, six different allergens in it. Um, uh, they, it has uh, ceramics, it has um, geraniol, it has um, hydroxycitronella. Um, this is a good uh, screening agent for allergy. However, it is not universal. It does miss um, some of the um, more uh, common now allergens such as linalool um, and limonene. Um, it can cross-react with balsam of Peru. This is a patient that I had had um, who was allergic to cinnamic alcohol and she was reacting to her Dr. Pepper, her diet Dr. Pepper, and she was getting these sublingual ulcers. We were able to get her off the soda and she'd had these for eight years. She'd had biopsies, she'd had, and they kept saying that were it was allergic. Well, she wasn't able to figure out what she was eating what she was allergic to, but when you do drink, uh, the drink does get under the tongue and that's how she was getting these lingual ulcers. It's important to remember that cinnamic alcohol is the uh, fragrance that's in tomatoes. Uh, it has a uh, artificial ingredient in cola that is very uh, similar in terms of structure. Uh, remember that ketchup is highly concentrated uh, tomato and will have a lot of cinnamic alcohol in it. Uh, we did a report on ketchup dermatitis in a group of children that we saw. Many fragrances are unnecessarily added to, um, to personal hygiene products such as deodorant, shampoos, conditioners, laundry detergents. Uh, fragrance-free alternatives do exist. Remember that unscented is not fragrance-free. Um, I had an atopic who came in with her parent and they were really, really uh, flared up and they had changed quote changed everything and they brought everything in for me to see and they'd switched over to unscented products and I showed her and I circled on the label where it said masking fragrance so masking fragrance is a fragrance that we can't smell um, it prevents us from being able to uh, uh, acknowledge the other ingredient smells in the product so just make sure that if you are putting somebody on a fragrance free regimen that you make sure to write down we actually have a, a, a picture that we show that says fragrance free and it's got a smiley face and an unscented it's got the flat line face and then fragranced is the down face so we just make sure that um, we're, we're making that education clear um, thimerosal um, is one of the ones on the commercially available kit. I don't generally put this one and paraphenylene diamine on my children under eight. If I were going to use the kit, I would cut this one and that other one off, the PPD off. Uh, it is a mercurial derivative. Um, it um, it can be uh, mercurials can still be used, um, although much less often in cosmetics. Uh, thimerosal can be used in contact lens solutions, but oftentimes this is clinically associated with a, an eyelid um, a reaction. Um, so one thing to think about um, if you look at the the literature and. Uh, uh, the Nash, I call them the National uh, Geographic Toxins. Um, if you think about mercurials, and this is one of the ones that uh, 
we reported and we've seen it reported too it's uh there's a, a an article in the literature called a swordfish dinner and a, and a red tattoo and the the patient every time they ate swordfish they they got a rash but their red tattoo would activate um, and we i also had a case and it's very interesting to see so seafood gorging because of the mercurial levels could uh, demonstrate uh, rashes and uh, reactivation in red tattoos tattoos. Uh, bisphenol A, uh, you'll, you see a lot of BPA free. Uh, this is a um, agent that is highly uh, uh, is related to epoxy um, and it's associated with plastics and plastic water bottles. And then formaldehyde um, uh, would be, it's a naturally occurring agent, um, but it is used as a preservative and it is oftentimes associated with allergy to hygiene products. So back when I was in my younger years, uh, I used to bet the fellows and have a good time doing things with them. So this one day, me and the fellow went to um, one of the local uh, places. My regret in this is I didn't tell the manager what I was going to do because uh, I think back and, you know, those days I was uh, I, I was funner, I think, uh, with shopping carts. But... I didn't think to tell a manager, but in retrospect, when I did tell a manager when I went into Whole Foods, they wouldn't let me do it, look at labels. They, they marched me out. When I told them, hey, I'm going to be here for a while looking at labels, they marched me out. So I don't know what the right thing to do was, but the fellow and I each got a basket. We each uh, picked an aisle, and the goal was to go down one aisle and back down the other side and see who could get the most number of products that had formaldehyde in it by the end of, of crossing over at the back end of the store and getting back to the front. Well, I was a faster reader. I also was the one that got caught. I got taken out of the drugstore and told not to come back. I did manage to quickly snap this shot before I was asked to leave. And uh, I, as you see, I only got half my basket full. But the, every single one of these products had a formaldehyde um in it a formaldehyde releaser and if you look you know it says as safe as water um you know the some of the advertising on on these uh containers is just uh fabulous and um anyway this was was this was one of my early early days and the thing that all of these have in common is uh is formaldehyde and, and that fellow is now a director of a contact dermatitis unit in Michigan and I I say to her do you know do you remember when we did this and she said yeah I let you win because I knew, I knew you were going to get caught so um, that was kind of a, a fun time and uh, I still I still uh, remember those events early times with the fellows so that's formaldehyde. This is one of our patients who uh, was uh, responding uh, to uh, one of their toys. Um, they actually um, uh, patch test positive and we were able to cover up the button and they got better. This is one of our patients who's got this in-step in -step clearing. Um, they had uh, shown to be positive to formaldehyde. They were wearing le leather flip-flops, which I had them stop using, they cleared, they had another rebound flare, and um, they came back in, and um, this area was spared. I looked through their topicals, and they had substituted a generic uh, steroid cream for the one I had given them, and that had imidazinal urea in it, which is a formaldehyde releaser, and they have they were flaring to the allergen in their topical cream. So you have to be careful because substitutions can occur without you realizing. So formaldehyde is on the uh, commercially available test. It's a colorless gas that is re readily soluble. It's used to make polymers and finishes. It's a widespread biologic. It is in plywood. Um, it is used in uh, the cosmetic industry. It is also used as a textile finish. It is what gives uh, cottons their wrinkle resistance or permanent press uh, type feature. Uh, formaldehyde and formaldehyde releasing preservatives.
derivatives. These are the names of the uh, formaldehyde releasing preservatives, um, and you can actually see it here through through the bottle. So um, it's a very very common allergen, uh, very important to be aware of. Remember that aspartame breaks down into methanol, which breaks down into your formaldehyde. So we do have patients who are allergic to formaldehyde with widespread distribution dermatitis who are reacting to aspartame. Again, food only becomes a picture into the picture in terms of avoidance once we have somebody with a widespread dermatitis. Um, so um, formaldehyde in food, there is no direct formaldehyde in food, but again, the aspartame. So you want to be aware of uh, NutraSweet or um, that, um, that component. Uh, I have uh, more, obviously, that I, more than I could ever be given enough time to share with you because I, I find this subject matter very, very interesting, and I hope that I've inspired you to find it interesting today rather than overwhelming, because I know when I started as a resident and they started rambling off these amazingly large names, I thought, I'll never be able to learn this. This isn't too much information, and the words are too hard, but what I learned over time is that the, if you say the words with confidence, Nobody knows you don't know how to say them. And then when you're at a contact dermatitis meeting, just use the acronyms because there's people there who do know how to say them. So with that, I would like to thank you again for allowing me to be a part of your, of your, of your training, allowing me to be a part of your lecture series. And I look forward to um, potentially um, going over the allergens of the year with you in a future date. Do you guys have any questions? Thanks, Dr. Jacob. We appreciate that. It was it was fun and very interesting. Um, I have a quick question for you. I was taught way back in my fellowship years that bleach, like we use for uh, cleaning some clothes, um, that it contains nickel in some of the cheaper forms. Is that true? Um, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, yeah, not that I'm aware of. But it may be um, it may be a leaching agent. Okay. So could potentially draw it from a metal water bottle or a metal pipe. So that might be um, something that um, would be considered. Okay, great. I, I couldn't ever find anything online to verify that. Um, some, you know, case reports, but no um, significant data. So, um, and then I, I, I love that your comment about um, the long-term memory of the skin um, I think you were talking about uh, recall with formaldehyde at the time. I, I think it's a little ironic as we look at vaccines, we can't seem to get the vaccines to have at least quality long-term memory, <laughs> but good old formaldehyde um, gets it through the skin. Yeah, uh, different, different um, immune system um, event as yeah. well. So, yeah. you know, that that's a good point. You know, I, you, you want to when patients are like, you know, I want my 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 body to forget, and I, I'll often use the tetanus shot as a as an example. I said, oh, but when you get your tetanus shot, you want it to remember it for ten years, right? And they're like, well, yeah, that hurts. I don't want to get it again, you know. Uh, so it is a different mechanism, but I will often use that to illustrate a point. I, I uh, you, your bleach question triggered me to mention something, um, and um, I, I wanted to, it, it, it's not related to allergy actually, it's related to uh, the fact that oftentimes we will consider giving our atopic patients bleach baths um, to lower the staph on their skin. Now it's important to remember that that will alkalinize the skin and make it more prone to having um, decreased ceramides and um, increased uh, uh, propensity to recolonize. So we get in this cycle of um, how do we break the cycle because we want to reduce the staff on the skin but we also don't want to set it up to re-engage itself. So one of the things that I do as an intervention point is bleach baths um, I will use uh, once a week, very dilute. I'll make sure to bleach the uh, towels and bedding 
at that same time. So uh, one of the interventions is making sure that the patient doesn't go in a bleach bath and then uses the towel that they used the day before. So um, that's one thing. But the other thing that I do, which um, I have found to be extraordinarily useful, is gentle acidification of the skin. So it's old school, of course, um, but what I'll do is I'll have the parent or the family member put take half a gallon of water uh, and put three or four tablespoons of vinegar in, and at the end of the shower, spray down the skin and pat dry. As they get out of the bleach bath, same thing. <laughs> neutralize and pat dry and then the next day vinegar again and a very very um, dilute it won't burn but it helps to reacidify the skin and by acidifying the skin in a gentle way um, obviously you don't want to swing it to the opposite side which is too acidic and then you're irritated from that you will increase the um, the enzymes in the skin that actually work to replace the ceramides. So you're, you're not only putting the skin into the right pH range to want to heal itself, you're encouraging it to do so. So your your bleach comment got me on my uh, mm. sensitive skin regimen, go down the pH corridor. Um, but I just think that that's something that's very, very important in our world. And when I say our world, I'm highly connected to our allergist. She came from uh, Jewish National, Dr. Trika. She's fabulous. And we work together on a lot of patients. And one of the things we work towards is, is making the skin less prone to being reactive. So that is something that um, I, I think that in our world, and, and when I say that, I mean the allergist, dermatologist, where we're connect, connected world, um, I think that that is um, a, a point, a tipping point where we can really affect change. Fantastic. Um, as far as our, our children with uh, impressive uh, eczema, is there any tolerability issue with the dilute vinegar? Does it burn? Well, not at that level. At okay. that level, it's so, so, so dilute. you got to make sure they don't, you know, do 50-50 or something like that. Or they, you, at that level, you shouldn't smell it. If you okay. can smell it, once it's mixed, it's too strong. Okay. But at the, at the 1 to 80... Um, which for most places is about three tablespoons in half a gallon um, or a quarter cup in a 20 gallon tub, um, you're going to be um, well, well, below, well below the threshold for irritancy. Fantastic. All right. Any other uh, questions from the group? All right. Looks like all is quiet. Well, again, Dr. Jacob, we, we appreciate you being here and, and sharing your expertise. Um, it's fantastic. I, I really enjoyed it, um, and I love the, the the stories, the more the case history and stories that really adds to it, makes things stick. So uh, appreciate it, and we, we hope we can entice you to do this again for us in the near future. Be happy to. Bye-bye. Okay. Very good. Thank you.